Thank you for words of welcome, and it's nice to return to somewhere that's quite familiar to us. Uh, we've had many, many happy memories of being with you in this meeting house down through the years and uh, through successive ministries. Turning to the scriptures, we are in Ephesians chapter 2. This is a well-known passage, quite familiar passage to many, and uh, we read there. Now, I was a bit late getting over to help the AV folks sort things out, so if there is a, a picture appearing on the screen, um, it's for the purposes of guiding our thoughts a little bit towards the right idea about what God has done for us versus the wrong idea that we might have about what he has done for us. It's the, it's the next picture after that. Now, I don't know whether that's clear. It's not so clear from my end, but, oh, big enough there. A friend of mine who I used to teach with in my early teaching days in Bally Clare, I used to keep in touch, still keep in touch with, and he sent me this. He sends me quite a, a lot of things. Do you know that there are people who used to believe that the earth was flat? Years and years ago, before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, around that time in the 1400s, there was doubts as to whether this was a globe, this was a spherical world, that there was the danger of falling off the edge if you sailed too far. So he sent me this, and he, he says, this is what might, have, might be the case if there was a surfing competition on a flat earth. You think of the people who surf over at Donegal's side and the waves coasting in. If they'd surfed on out in a wave to the horizon just to fall off the edge. Why do I use that? Well, simply pointing out that if you've got the wrong idea about something, which this would suggest the surfers had in the competition organized, if you had the wrong idea about something, it can lead to awful consequences. And if we have the wrong idea as believers about what God has done for us, that can lead to all sorts of consequences. Not least, doubts. Big doubts. So that's what we're addressing today. Thinking about where Christ is seated, and as we will read in this passage, we also are seated. How did we get there? Let's read together from God's Word. Ephesians chapter 2. Don't need a picture anymore, by the way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Verse 6, once again. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You think you're seated in church today, don't you? You'd say, of course I am. Do you realize that 
in Christ Jesus. As a believer, as someone who rests their hope on him alone, you're seated with him in the heavenlies. You've entered another kingdom, another dimension entirely. And you might physically be here, but you are actually there. I didn't make that up. That's what it says. In our service today, I want to tease out the steps that God has done, the things that God has done for us to get us to that seat. More of that later on. In my time ministering in Castle Wellen, as we were stationed for nearly eight years uh, after my time up in Oma, there was a, a strap line which I tried to attach to the ministry period there. And over that period of time, I would have to say a few people got it, were able to, you know, regurgitate it back to me. A lot of people got the message, but they couldn't maybe necessarily say the exact words back. This was the statement. Only God can do for you what you cannot possibly do for yourself. Only God can do for you what you cannot possibly do do for yourself. To elaborate on that a little bit, we say only God through Jesus Christ can do for you what you cannot possibly do for yourself. The scriptures tell us that Jesus is seated on high. The scriptures that we read also tell us we are seated there with him. That's one of those things we could not possibly organize, arrange, do, or achieve ourselves. It is a work of God. So in the next few moments, what I want to tease out is the steps, the parts, the bits and pieces, the ingredients, word it whatever way you wish, that God has put in to make it possible for fallen people, sinners, undeserving people like us, to be seated with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, in his eternal kingdom. Now, we normally think of up there and afterlife and all of that sort of thing for heaven and home. Think of it in this way to enlarge your thoughts. That seat with Christ is a seat with him in a, a realm, a dominion, outside of what we see and know and experience right now. You get a glimpse of that in the New Testament, in examples like when the, the apostles or disciples were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and with them appearing in glory and radiant attire, whatever the, the vision or apparition was, it wasn't an apparition, whatever the appearance was, was Moses and Elijah. They had a glimpse into another dimension, another kingdom. Same was true of the shepherds at the announcement of Jesus' birth. Shepherds witnessed angelic beings and the heavens, the other world being opened up. It's that world. It's that other dimension where Christ lives, reigns, is seated, but he governs this one, the scene of time, and he says, we are seated in that other dimension, in that other kingdom, in the heavenlies, with him. So what has God done to make that possible? Turn, please, to Ephesians. It will be most helpful if you're looking at the passage. If there are pew Bibles there, it's 1173 in your, the pew Bible to be seen where this comes from. I will read the passage a little bit later on, but I want to give you maybe three points, three steps, as I'm calling them, to the seat that God has prepared. And then we will read the whole context of that. So beginning at verse 4 of Ephesians 1, this is what the Apostle Paul tells us. God chose to save. 
He predestined to save people for himself. Verse 4 goes like this. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. Moving down to verse 11, it says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Now, if you've been in church contexts and or even discussions and conversations, that word predestined and its co-word predestination has caused people all sorts of difficulties and problems because people are very quick to jump to the idea of, well, if God chose this one, does that mean he didn't choose this one? Or if God predestined this, well, why did it work out this way? I just want to bring a question to that whole conversation, and it's simply this. What if our God had no plan at all? What if he had no plan at all? What if the creator, let's acknowledge the fact that even scientists will acknowledge this, there's some cause that results in all of this being here. There's some cause that brought existence into being. They don't want to say it's God, of course, but it is God. God made, God created all that we see and, and stuff that we don't see. But what if the divine maker had no plan whatsoever beyond that? I'll just make all this stuff. I, I delight in making things, so I would just keep making and I'll leave it to flounder to its own devices. Now, would you agree with me in your heart of hearts? This world is floundering. This world is in difficulty. We as individuals are in difficulty. Well, what if it, God had no plan whatsoever, whatsoever? What if he had no choice? What if he didn't decide to do anything? We have to set that train of thought alongside the questions we might bring about why. Why does this happen? Why does that The scriptures tell us God made a choice. God chose to save. He predestined even before he created. Oh, this is a very big God when we think that way. God chose, designed to have people for himself even before he made them. This is a big being we're speaking of. This is an eternal being we're speaking of who has a plan. And if he is God, he has a right and every right to have the plan that's perfect and to make it happen. And we are creatures who must, we can question, yes, but must be guarded about where we go with our questioning. So there's point one. God chose to save. God predestined to save a people for himself. There is a plan behind all of this. And what does that involve? Step two, verse five. That plan includes God redeeming and adopting. Verse 5 reads like this. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So God's plan is initiated through Jesus Christ. No other way. Not different routes, different plans, one single plan, and it's through Jesus Christ. But that plan includes redemption and adoption. What do those words make us think of? Redemption is probably better understood in the day of Paul writing this because slaves were very commonplace. Every time there was any kind of conquering army, there were, there were slaves from what was conquered. And slaves were in servitude. Slaves weren't employees. Slaves were slaves. 
with no rights, no real income, unless you had a good master who sort of looked out for you and realized this person is useful to me, I will keep him, I will look after him or her. Slaves were people who couldn't really help themselves much. They were at the whim of another. And that's how we are described within Scripture. We are described as slaves. In the sense of we don't have much to offer. In the sense of we don't have any rights or privileges. In the sense we don't really have the ability to help ourselves out of the situation that we're in. So God's plan is one that includes redemption. Redemption of those who are enslaved to our nature our fallenness, our sinfulness. In many, many respects, we can't help but do wrong and disobey God and fall short of his commands. So God, in his plan, his infinite plan, he includes redemption to sort that out. And with that, then, he has adoption. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons. Now, being adopted as a son is a privileged position. And you understand how adoption works in in the human sense. There have been parents who have longed for a child, can't have a child, and they make a decision to adopt a child. Or there are parents who just want to extend their family and say there are children there who need parents. We We will go down the line of adoption. Now, think of it this way. There's a wee baby out there. His parents gone, it's abandoned. Needs adopting. There's a process to go through. It's complex, it's difficult in the human sense to go through that. Has the baby any part to play in it? Does the baby say, adopt me, adopt me. I'm a good baby. Can't, sure it can't. So in God's plan to adopt us, it's not because he hears the cry coming up from us, adopt me, I'm a good person. Adopt me, I'm deserving of this. Adopt me, I'll be a blessing to your home. I'll be such a good baby in your home. God doesn't hear us responding like that because we haven't got it in us to respond like that. But God chooses to redeem us. And adopt, and he gives us a status not as an adopted slave, second class person in, in his family, but adopts us to be sons, gives us position. We have those pictures of redemption and rescue and adoption portrayed in the many stories in the Bible. To mention but a, a couple, you know how the children of Israel were delivered from bondage and slavery in Egypt. That's a kind of redemption process. They were made God's chosen people. They were given status and all the rest of it under Moses. And then the adoption or the restoration into God's family is very clearly sort of portrayed in scriptures like uh, the prodigal son who's, who was wayward, wasn't deserving of anything. Even if he'd cried out and said, Father, come and help me, he had to get up of his, his rear end and go back and, and make things right and say, I've, I've sinned against you and against all that you stand for. And I took and I went and I squandered it. And the father adopted him back into the family and restored him to the status of a son. And that's what God is doing to allow us to have a seat with Christ in his eternal kingdom. So there's two points there, but there's lots of things in those points. God has a plan. God chose to save. He chose from before even he made us to save And then with that comes redemption. God's plan includes redemption and being brought into his family, adopted to be his son. If you want the gender nonspecifics, then we'll have the son and daughter in there, children of God, not simply servants. Step three, what goes along with this as well? steps to the seat, what God has done to make it possible for us to be seated with Christ. Step three, God forgives. 
Verse 7 tells us about that, those same verses. In him we have redemption. How? Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, when we talk about forgiveness of sins, then we have to talk about penalty, and we have to realize there were consequences for our sinfulness, and that had to be dealt with. So step three, God forgives. God forgives sins. How does he do that? Through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus. Of course, you know that to be true. But what did that involve? That involved Jesus taking what we deserved. Jesus paying for what we couldn't pay. Jesus taking God's wrath and God's separation that we deserved. And through that we are granted forgiveness and pardon. For many years we attended Hill Street Church in Lurgan and uh, the Minister Emeritus there, I think it's the right title, Reverend Drew Moore, used to work in the law courts in Belfast and there's one of the stories that he used. We heard about the law courts all the time uh, from his ministry but one of the stories he, he used to use on this point was about the justice of uh, the magistrate dealing with, we'll call him Jimmy, who was up for drunk and disorderly behaviour yet again. And of course the, the court situation is that if you're up several times it goes from you know petty crime to serious crime. If you can't pay the fine then you must do the time. So the magistrate is faced with a, a dilemma. Here's Jimmy up before him again and the court says, the law says he can't be forgiven because he's guilty. He maybe was involved in the assault of the arresting officers and so on. He hasn't the money to pay the fine. The only consequence then is imprisonment. And this magistrate knows Jimmy well because Jimmy's been up before and, and they know full well there's a wife and children at home. And this was in the mouth of Christmas. So if he puts Jimmy in jail, that means he's taken the father from those children at Christmas. Now he doesn't deserve to be let out for Christmas. He doesn't deserve any of that. But his wife doesn't deserve not to have him. So what's he going to do? And this is how the story goes, and this is true. The magistrate pronounces the sentence about the fine. Knowing very well, Jimmy can't afford the fine. So therefore he'd have to say, well, you can't afford the fine, right? Well, you'll have to do a month or whatever in prison. So he pronounces the sentence. Let's say the fine's 50 quid. Then he gets off the bench and he goes down to the clerk of the court, puts his hand in his pocket and takes out the money, pays the fine. <coughs> and he says to Jimmy, the law's been satisfied. The debt's been paid. The fines from Ted get you away home to your wife and your children and don't be coming back into my court again. You see what's involved there? Forgiveness to the undeserving, but yet justice satisfied. That's what happens at the cross. That's what happens through the blood of Jesus Christ to grant forgiveness of sins. The debt is paid. And we're told we're free. And we're told furthermore, we have a seat with Christ. We have a seat with the very judge who has the right to condemn us. So follow those three points through, those three steps through. Visualize it as you like for your stairs at home or your steps up to your house. Step one, God has a plan. And that plan includes the rescue and the choosing to rescue the likes of you and me. Step two, God redeems, pays, pays debts that we couldn't pay, sorts out what we couldn't sort out, does for us what we can't do for ourselves. He adopts. He does that because we can't do that either for ourselves. He forgives. We can't do that because we're the ones who are the offenders. And he grants us a seat with Christ. 
a new status, a new position. Now let's read that passage. Do you see that's what the apostle is saying? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. These things we've been speaking of. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment and to bring all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Now here's the question to ponder for a moment or two. What is there for you and I to do? What's God expecting us to do? Scratch your head. What could the answer be? When we read through that and we tease it out as I've done in steps, God did the choosing, God does the planning, God does the redeeming, God does the adopting, God does the predestining, predestining, <laughs> nearly got that word, he does the forgiving. What bit did we do? Nothing. Do you see it? Nothing. Because only God can do for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. Only God through Jesus Christ can do for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. And yet, as a minister, and as your minister would find the same, going round homes, going round hospitals, getting into conversations with people in the course of ministry, do you know what the most common thing we hear? I just do the best I can. I'm sure God should be happy with that. The scriptures teach us that only God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Only God can give us and allocate us and take us to the seat that he has promised in Christ, that he has sorted out in Christ. Only God can do that for us because we're incapable of doing it for ourselves. But he does more. Let's read from verse 13 and we'll see the the point that comes out that's in addition to what I've said. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. Ah, there's a wee bit for us to do. Believe it. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, can you see the additional bit that God does in that? Having believed, you were marked 
in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Step four, it's this. God marks those he has chosen, those he has redeemed, those he has forgiven, those he has adopted. He marks them with a seal, God's Holy Spirit. Because how did he make it happen in the first place? He, he, he uses the Holy Spirit to bring the reality, all of that, into existence in our lives. So in doing that and initiate it from God's point of view, using his Holy Spirit to open our eyes, open our hearts, make us realize we can't sort this out ourselves, causing us to realize Christ has done it all, that same Spirit acts like a deposit, guaranteeing the work is done and it's done well. Now you and I understand the issue of deposit quite well. If you were in the, the car buying uh, series of your life, you'd go out to uh, a dealership and so on and I'm sure not too many of you are rattling around with 20 or 30 or 40 thousand pounds in your back pocket just to say there it is, we'll pay cash for it. Um, no, normally what we do is we, we do a finance deal. And you might have gathered up £5,000 between the car you've got and the, the money that you've got. And you might say, I can get a deposit down here of five grand, and I'll be paying whatever number, £100 a month here on. But here's the thing that happens when you do that. You get the keys of the car on the basis of the contract that's sealed with the deposit, don't you? And you drive out seated in your brand new 4x4 or 2x2, whatever it happens to be. The deal is done when the, the contract is signed. We're, we're of a generation where when we were first married, we went into Rob's department store in Belfast and we had a wee flat and we needed a single bed to have a spare room. And we put a deposit down. Imagine paying... I think the bed was going to cost us something like £30, but you had to put a deposit down and buy it on the never-never on higher purchase. So the, the fiver went down, we signed the deal, we got the bed home right away. The deal was done. You understand how that works in the physical sense. It's the same in the spiritual. God does this to us. God does this for us. God then seals it to us with the very presence of his Holy Spirit. And that's why the Apostle Paul in his book of Romans says that spirit who comes into our lives and into our hearts and into our beings, that's the spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, there's a sudden realization, God has forgiven me. God has done all for me in Christ. God is my Father. And the sort of hope maybe disappears and the certainty comes in. I trust that's your experience. I do trust that it's you're not one of those people who says, well, I just do the best I can and I just worship God in my own wee way and I hope God will be pleased with that. Folks, God won't be pleased with that because God has done all for you in Christ so that you may embrace his loving truth, the gospel. So I give you something today which is a tremendous privilege, an absolutely unthinkable, hard to describe privilege that in Christ we are seated with him. It's more secure than the seat on the airline. It's more secure than that place at a wedding ceremony or a wedding reception. It's more definite than that. Sealed by what Jesus has done and he has had a plan to do this and he's implemented it and he's done it well. What's left for us? To rest on it. And resting on it is doing nothing except believing it's true, it's real, and it's complete in him. If you've never seen the gospel like that, if you've never seen that gospel truth like that, then it's like you are still on the flat earth idea. And there's great perils ahead going down that wrong road. Aren't, isn't there? Can't you see that? but realize that God has done all, that the whole message of the gospel 
It's not maybe what you thought it was. And God has done for you what you can't do for yourself. And he's done it well, and he's done it right, and he will seal it to you by his Holy Spirit. What have you to do? It's like the Christmas gift. You put out your hands and you take it. You don't deserve it. But you can't embrace it. And what he does is grant you the assurance through that Holy Spirit that you are actually, I can't fully get my head around this, but that you are actually here and now seated with your Savior Jesus Christ in his eternity. You've been opened up to that new dimension, that whole new other existence of God's kingdom, and you're seated with him right there. What a message. What a message to be able to share on a Sunday morning. What a message of hope. What a message to pass on to others. But what should our response be? In the light of what Jesus has done, in the light of God's plan, in the light of all of that, that should affect our life and our witness and how we live. But I'll take you down that road when I come back again another time. This book has these postures in it. Sit, as in seated with Christ. Walk, as in walk with Christ. Walk for Christ. And then it has stand. Stand for him. Stand strong for him. You can't stand strong if you haven't realized what he's done for you. You can't walk with him, unless you realize what he's done for you in the first place. So I urge you then today, make sure of your confidence in Christ and all that he has done for you to make it the case that you are seated with him right now. You may be familiar with Holman Hunt's painting of Christ standing outside the door. It's linked to Revelation chapter 3 with these words. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Means are shared in a seated, seated position. Then it goes on to say this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's say the words of the grace, if you can, together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.